strength of his people and the stronghold of salvation to his anointed one. O Lord, save thine own people and give thy blessing unto thine inheritance. O feed them also and set them up forever. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord. My God, be not silent unto me, lest if thou makest though thou hearest not, I become like them that go down into the Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord is the strength of his people and a stronghold of salvation to his anointed one. O Lord, save thine own people and give thy blessing unto thine inheritance. O feed them also and set them up forever. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom those secrets are hid, <coughs> cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, Christ have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. Lord, have mercy upon <coughs> us. Glory be to God on high. And, and on, on earth, earth peace, goodwill good will toward towards man. man. We, we praise thee, thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord, our God, heavenly King, God, the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only God of his Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord, God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, our most high the glory of God, God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O God, who hast prepared for those who love thee such good things as past man's understanding, pour into our hearts such love toward thee, that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
The epistle is written in the sixth chapter of Blessed Paul the Apostle's epistle to the Romans, beginning with the third verse. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, and in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here in the epistle. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Turn me again, O Lord, at the last, and be gracious unto thy servants. Lord, thou hast been our refuge from one generation to another. St. Matthew, beginning with the 20th verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. <clears throat> Jesus said unto his disciples, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. 
But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whiles thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, though thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Praise be to thee, O Christ. <clears throat> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and who was as incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Well, you've heard the epistle and gospel readings appointed for this Sunday. And I could take the line that Jesus says in the opening that we've heard from Matthew. 5, verse 20, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no, in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. I could take that and then preach from Romans 6, either something that makes you f believe that the real message is that because you're in Christ and you have faith, you automatically are living up to that or really don't have to worry about it because you have his righteousness. Or I can, as St. Paul was actually saying in this passage, tell you that because you are baptized into Christ and indeed by grace are entering into his righteousness, you have an obligation to live to God, to be dead to sin and alive to God. 
Now, I preached a few weeks ago on the, what it is that we will rise from the dead and partake of the immortal nature of Jesus who risen from the dead dies no more. And I certainly took part of this passage to preach that because it's so, it's so important to read those words. Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. St. Paul isn't saying to us, okay, because you're justified by faith, uh, you are therefore automatically free from the need to live with a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, been 500 years of a lot of preaching that makes us look at the Sermon on the Mount and not take it too seriously. But if I am to look at the Sermon on the Mount in light of Paul's actual emphasis in Romans chapter 6, I would say you better take it very seriously. St. Paul is not saying because you have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ, you're not subject to the commandments of God. He does say that this means that you are, in a sense, freed from the law. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you're free from the commandments of God. It doesn't mean that at all. It means you're not made righteous by the ritual observance of such things as required, really, the presence of the temple and the Levitical priesthood. You're not justified by those things that are the works of the law, such as being circumcised, such as bringing your sacrifice and keeping all the feasts and so forth. But you are not free from being required to live a life of works of love. And really works of love are works of faith. Because you see, if you look at the Pauline doctrine, and this was actually reflected in a, a sermon of, of Martin Luther's when he was young. So this is not something that all the, all the Protestant Reformation people should, should reject. This was actually reflected in one of Luther's sermons I remember reading. Because in this, he, he, he was quite correct when he pretty much made this almost mathematical, <laughs> uh, almost, it's almost addition, you know, one plus one plus one equals three. Uh, faith produces love. Love produces good works. Now, this is still consistent with the fact that the just shall live by faith. This is still totally consistent with the fact that Abraham, believed, or Abram as he was still called at that point in Genesis 15, but it's Abraham, believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Believe the word, same word in Hebrew is, well, the word in Hebrew is amen, which means that he believed that what God revealed was true. And the just do live by faith. Well, what is faith? Is faith a passive life? Is faith a life of merely accepting doctrines and believing them? I say that a life of faith is a life that, that is a life that is walking in faith and walking in the Spirit. So Jesus says, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. This doesn't mean you have to be better at tithing, mint and rule and coming. And it doesn't mean that you look at God's New covenant requirements the same way as they looked at the law. For example, right now, I know some of you are troubled, I know. And you're troubled for a reason that 
is on one hand a good reason to be troubled. You, you haven't been able, many of you, to be in your churches and you haven't received the sacrament. Many of you since March because of the pandemic. Well, let me point something out about that. Because Romans 6 is about one of the two sacraments of the gospel. The fact that I would say there are seven sacraments and two of them are sacraments of the gospel is not a contradiction. The two sacraments that Jesus appointed are, of course, baptism and the supper of the Lord. This is a sacramental passage in Romans. But let me point out about sacraments. I hope that you do not think they're merely a replacement for the rituals of the law, the works of the law, such as the ones I mentioned, being circumcised, keeping the feast days, bringing your sacrifice to the Levitical priest, that kind of thing. They're not a, a replacement for that. And I want you to understand when you can gather in church and when you can receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, this is one of the ways in which God provides a means of grace. But if during a time such as this, or maybe someone's a prisoner of war, as I said a few weeks ago, or something else beyond one's control, please bear in mind, this doesn't mean you're condemned that your sins aren't forgiven, or that God is withholding grace. Because for a while there's been a reason why it's, you haven't been given the sacrament. It doesn't mean that you are outside of God's grace because the sacramental system is not a replacement for the works of the law. It is a means of grace, and faith is a means of grace. Reading the scriptures so that you hear the word of God brings you the... Oh, it's not one of the seven sacraments, you might say, but it's sacramental. It brings you the grace of God. Now, I'm going to say something right now, though. When it comes to the gathering of the church, we need, we need to understand that it should also be something that pleases God. I believe that the new covenant equivalent of bringing your sacrifice or the new co a new covenant picture of something akin to that of bringing your sacrifice to the altar of course would be receiving the sacrament from the altar. And therefore these words of Jesus are fascinating and important and necessary and as I said earlier, the Sermon on the Mount wasn't written just to tell you, well, you're a sinner, everything's hopeless, don't worry about it. You can't possibly live up to this. That's not why Jesus preached this. He is commanding us to live up to it. That's what being a disciple of Jesus means, that we hear what our rabbi teaches and we obey and we believe. So there's a meaning for us here. Therefore... You've already heard the whole gospel reading appointed for today. So let me draw this out of it. <clears throat> Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. And you know, maybe, maybe, a lot of people aren't able to gather in churches right now for a reason. Maybe God wants us to hear something and that we better get it straight when we are all back together in church. Now, I'm still holding services, but I know why many people are, are just not able even to come, especially the elderly. And, and we're never full here. And yes, we do keep social distancing. And yes, the people have masks because they are considerate, not because 
No, I'm not going to get into that. If you're making a political issue out of things like that, I urge you to really do some deep thinking about why you should not. It is not a political matter. But we're holding services here. But I know why most, most of the people, at least many of them, uh, are still not able to gather. And if they're able, why they have reasons why they believe it is more responsible and prudent to wait even now, even though it's been so long, but I in no way criticize or condemn that. I respect that. People need to act in the way they know is responsible before God. I understand it. But when we're all gathered together again, let's hope there's something we have learned during this time. Yes, you've heard me make this comment before. I'll say it again. One of the things that's so ridiculous in the church is when people split up and break apart and get angry with each other. And we've seen a lot of that in the history of our own church, the continuing churches. And so what do they do? Well, they have separate churches. They get a priest to make sure the sacrament's valid. And then without any reconciliation, without any attempt to be reconciled one to another, to know that maybe I have caused an offense, and if so, I must go to my brother and be forgiven. No, absolutely no regard for that. They gather together, and they think everything's fine as long as the priest is validly ordained and the sacrament is valid. Well, no, that doesn't make everything okay in and of itself. It doesn't please God when Christians do that. That's not what our rabbi told us as his disciples. You say, wait a minute, that's inconvenient. Well, search your own heart. If the cause of your brother's offense is something where you realize you're at fault, Jesus is telling you God's not pleased if you come as if that wasn't the case. That's just as serious as letting yourself need to be reconciled to Almighty God instead of repenting of your sin and asking his forgiveness. I say this, the Lord is saying that during this time, his people must learn this is his hand of judgment on unbelievers and of chastening for correction to believers. And the correction is so that when we gather back together, the way in which we gather pleases our Father in heaven. It's more than just an obligation of having a valid sacrament. It's also a sacramental life in which we are not in any way overcome with unrighteousness and in which we are reconciled to God and to one another so that when we come to receive the gift from this order, it, he is as pleased to give it as he was when people brought a good sacrifice to the old orders and he was pleased with the sacrifice of Abel, not of Cain. Let God be pleased with us when we gather at his table. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, be ascribed as is most justly do all my majesty, dominion, power, and glory, henceforth world without end.